Good evening, everyone. We're in the uh, regular business meeting of the District of Squamish for November 21st. Welcome to all and please tell us about the Squamish Welcome to the traditional territory of the Squamish Nation. There's an amended agenda in front of the Council. Uh, the only um, change is that um, the Squamish Legal Watch has been deferred till the uh, Public and Public Services meeting next week. Um, so with that change, move the amended agenda, moved by Councillor Kent, seconded by Councillor Elliott. All those in favour? Opposed to any motion carries. Uh, are there any noses? <coughs> Seeing none, um, we have a couple of uh, delegation pro and proclamations. First up, the Squamish Community Foundation update. Uh, okay, welcome. <coughs> So good evening, Mayor and Councillors. Um, my name is Doug Hackett, and I'm president of the Squamish Community Foundation. And tonight I'd like to update you on what has happened at the Squamish Community Foundation uh, in 2017, and also look ahead to 2018. And we've had a, a really successful year this year, not, uh, not in small part from our, um, our association with the district and, and help in some areas. So I'd like to start with the Canada 150 uh, grant. This was a grant put out by the federal government through Community Foundations of Canada. It involved uh, grants of uh, $10,000, but they had to be matched by the community foundation in the, uh, in the community. And then they were also matched by the, the re grant recipient. So they had to be matched in either volunteer time or services, donated services, etc. So that $10,000 initial grant ended up being $40,000 uh, of impact in the community. So we had our first grant, which was matched from the Squamish Community Foundation's uh, operating fund, uh, and that went to a number of recipients. Uh, but it went so well that we were offered another $10,000, which unfortunately we did not have the means to, uh, to match, uh, but I hate to leave money on the table. Um, and so the district considered that, and, uh, and the district matched those funds, thank you very much, and we were able to fund an additional two uh, grants in the community, one to the Mamquam River Campground Society and one to Squamish Arts Council for an expanded Art Walk Canada 150. So, <clears throat> in effect, uh, two $1,000 or $10,000 grants from the government ended up being $80,000 of community impact thanks to the, the District of Squamish and the work of the Squamish Community Foundation. It was a very successful program. Um, I'd like to talk about vital signs as well. This is a program um, that uh, uh, we have run before. So uh, we have done two previous vital signs reports, one in 2014, one in 2011. <clears throat> they, um, they're really a snapshot of the community based on, uh, on data statistics that we can gather that are, are provided by the Community Foundations of Canada in areas that the community identifies as the key areas that they want to look at. Um, so this was our, our third report. Um, we started with a, a really successful public kickoff in the spring, um, and then we worked with a community, or, or sorry, a committee of, of community champions uh, to identify the areas that uh, were of concern and to look at those, look at the data that we could gather and see where we had to gather more data. Um, normally we would have released the report in October. Um, Nationwide, uh, the health data was being delayed, and so community foundations had the choice of publishing without the health data or postponing and waiting for the health data. And we decided the health data was really important for the areas that we had identified, uh, and therefore we chose to delay the report. So we will be publishing the report early in January, and it will contain the, the local health data that uh, has been gathered. <coughs> and the last uh, the last program, or the, the, the last new program that we were working on for 2017, and this is a program that I, uh, has been something that I've wanted to bring to Squamish for a number of years. It's the Neighborhood Small Grants Program. It was championed originally by the Vancouver Foundation. Uh, it involves going around the, uh, the CRA restrictions on who we can grant to. Normally, as a foundation, we can only grant to somebody with a tax number. Um, but the Neighborhood Small Grants Program allows us to partner with somebody with a tax program uh, and they can grant to other people. And so these grants are $500 for community members that want to bring uh, their community together. And I just want to 
to read the mission of the, and the, the principles of the neighborhood small grants. The idea is to harness local skills and experiences in order to foster community self-direction and empowerment to make neighborhoods better places to live. And there's some very simple prin principles. Everyone has gifts, small is beautiful, local is best, where we live matters, we learn together, and everyone is invited. This is a, a great program. It's designed so that individuals, uh, children, can apply for a grant. It's a simple application of four questions. Who are you? What would you like to do? What do you need? Um, very simple stuff. Um, so we were able to get uh, start with a partnership with the Squamish Volunteer Center Society. They are our, our um, five-year partner in this. We also have a partnership with the Vancouver Foundation, and for the next five years, <coughs> excuse me, they'll be matching every dollar that we put into the program. Um, so, so this program is assured for the next five years. We ran kind of a pilot in September. It was really fast because we just got all of the, the agreements in place in August. We opened for, uh, for grant applications in September. We had to, to close at the end of the month because they had to be processed and ready to go to our grants evening in October, uh, and they had to be finished their event by Christmas. But it was a, it was a good chance to tell the community about what we were doing. Uh, we did get, uh, we got five applications. Uh, one of them couldn't be finished for December, and so they've agreed to move their application into the spring. Um, but um, some of the, one of the events is already finished. The other two events will be finished before December. One of the events was uh, some, some training in food canning um, for, and, and food security. So uh, somebody sharing their knowledge uh, in their kitchen about how to can things. So um, these programs have been really successful in other communities and I'm looking forward to them being very successful here. So looking ahead to 2018, I'm really sad to say that this is my last year of eligibility on the board. We have a, a term limit and so in October of this year, I'll be stepping down off the, the Community Foundation Board, but we have a, a really strong, committed board. We have a strategic plan that is already in operation. I have no doubt that the Community Foundation will continue uh, to grow and be strong in the community. My personal goal is to strengthen our endowments uh, in the next year, so that involves fund growth and making sure that we're getting maximum returns on our investments, because those returns translate directly into grants to the community. Um, so Vital Science, as I mentioned, will be finishing that in January. Um, in the past, we've treated Vital Science as an event. It happens every three years. We kind of ramp up and then we publish it and then we go, thank God, we don't have to do that for three years. Um, but really, this year we're going to try and change it more to a process. So we're going to publish and in the first year we need to, to have some events where we discuss what the results are with the community and uh, what do those results mean. In the second year, we're going to look for opportunities for quick funding things that can see if we can move the needle in areas that the, that the community is interested in. And in the third year, we can evaluate the effect of that, whether we were successful and publish a new report. So we're going to try and change this more to a process instead of an event. And I think that will provide better value in the long run. Um, the Neighborhood Small Grants Program, uh, we will be looking at expanding the program. The applications this year will be in February. Um, people will have the entire year to hold their event, which is a little bit easier. Um, and, and we'll have some celebrations along the way. The, the, um, the Neighborhood Small Grants is designed to be not bureaucratic. We don't require anybody to, to give us a spreadsheet or a final report we require them to come to an event and talk about what they did and how it helped their community. So, um, and that brings up an area that I'm hoping that we can discuss with the district. Um, there's two opportunities that I see in neighborhood small grants. One of them is, is obviously funding. We can make the program bigger and any dollars that are put into it over the next five years are going to be matched by the Vancouver Foundation, so that, that helps us grow it very quickly. But there's a second area, and that is streamlining the permit process. Um, in other communities, what's, uh, what is probably the bulk of neighborhood small grant applications are for block parties and things like that to bring neighbors together, bring them out of their houses, and get to know each other. Um, but we have a, we have a, a permit process um, that is pretty much the same if you are a large music foundation 
or if you're a couple of children wanting to run an art uh, event on your street. Um, so right now, there's a nine-page special events permit. I'm not I, I tried to go through it. it um, I'm not sure that children would be able to go through it. Um, there on, may, on our side? Yes. For our process? Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So, um, and, and it's possible that they would need a traffic management permit, and then there's our, there are liability uh, insurance. And I understand that the, the district has to protect themselves and the citizens of Squamish, but I'm wondering if, if there's some way that we can find a split so that we're not treating large music foundations the same way as couple of children wanting to put on a street event um, because it would these grants are, are $500 and it would be a shame if most of that was taken up in permit and liability charges so um, we would love to work with you if that's possible to look at how that might be uh, might be changed to to encourage street events to encourage neighbors to get out and and do things together and I, I think overall that would be uh, it would be a benefit to, to Squamish not just for the neighborhood small grants but in general for for neighborhoods that want to put on events. Um, so thank you very much for your time, and um, I look forward to the next president talking to you next year. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Doug. Um, I went to your annual giving event, and uh, some amazing projects that the foundation supported, and I think um, your board and your uh, team has done a great job of building it. I really love this neighborhood small grant program. And I'd love to see how we could help leverage that too, not only perhaps with consideration, and this is something we can deliberate in the budget, maybe there's a portion that we consider that, um, matching dollars too to help really inspire these throughout the community. But you bring up, I think, a real interesting piece with regard to uh, facilitating these things so that we're not uh, encumbering them with a, a bureaucracy that may be unnecessary. So I think that's a whole conversation that, that we have to have with staff in terms of how we might do that. I know a couple of years ago there was a couple of events, there was a vigil, and there's a few other sort of real community events that we figured out a way to facilitate very quickly and streamline because they really aren't for-profit events. They're really not, um, they're really geared toward community events. So I think there, there hopefully is a way we can we can fine tune that to make it simple so we're not discouraging these just because there's a too cumbersome a process. So I think that's a great suggestion and I, I just love the idea of these small neighborhood grants. Um, I think they're great. And the, just on the vital signs, it's a really valuable tool and I like the progression you've taken it to so that it's a process that we actually have a real conversation in the community about and then target specific um, outcomes that we'd like to see to improve the numbers to real to really see a, a benefit to knowing the numbers. I, I think, and this is all, I know this has been a challenge with you guys too, is some things we get numbers that are, aren't 100% quantifiable to Squamish, they might include the Sunshine Coast, and there's, so it'd be good on some of the things where we're questioning or we really want to dig down deeper is to really maybe go and mine the data even more so we're, we're knowing it's really relevant. So there's, there's sort of two processes there. We might want to mine the data more to see how we really be proactive and relevant to the community. So, but I think, I think the Community Foundation is doing a great job and um, really important piece of this puzzle. And I know you have lots of former council members who I'm sure bring really good value to your board. And you've got a really strong board. Great job. Thank you. Just briefly, I, I mean, I know there is a two-term limit, I think, and you're running the end of your term, but you only have to take one year out, and then you are eligible. <laughs> Just in case you lost that point. I'm, I'm counting the days. They remind you of that. Awesome. Any other comments or questions for the foundation? Well, uh, thanks, Doug. Maybe what I will do is re refer... Um, the small uh, neighborhood small grants to our budget process for uh, deliberation, as well as possibly to a public and public services committee to discuss um, how we might ease the bureaucratic burden a little on those. Thank you so very much. I'll Thank move you. that. Is that clear enough for you, Karen? Mm -hmm. Seconded by Hand, Councillor Elliott. Um, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, moving on, we have uh, Vancouver Biennale, and I don't see Barry here, but it looks like Amara is here. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Thank 
Thank you. Thanks for having us here, Mayor and Council. Um, two, two sort of parts. One is recapping the 214-216 Vancouver Biennale, specifically in Squamish. We had a great two years with lots of participation, 14 artists in the community, and we'll sort of talk about as well going ahead into 2018-2020, and we have more exciting things lined up. So we'd like to present uh, Mayor and Council with these two plaques that really document all of the projects. As I said, there's 14 artists that were here over the two years, 11 of them through our residency program. So these are young, talented artists from 20 different countries around the world that spend time in Vancouver and Squamish, and 11 of them lived up at Quest through our partnership with the university. So they spent four weeks in the community and engaged different groups from First Nations to the Carvers to Film and the Britannia Mine Museum, and they created installations all across the community. Um, some of these artists are really talented and their careers have really taken off after their time in Squamish. And every time we speak to them or look at them on social media, they're always referencing their time in Squamish. I know Jonathan Luckhurst, one of our Canadian artists, actually moved back into Squamish after his time here. And a couple of others have, including Tamam, is now recording other artists and colleagues to come out to Squamish and, and participate in the Biennale. So we think that's sort of our most exciting program because it really creates a strong relationship with the community and it creates a network of these artists that then go across the world and helps help spread the word about Squamish and their time here and how that sort of furthered their career goals as artists. Um, the other program is the Open Air Museum and that's the large scale public art installations of which we had three. The most iconic one of course is The Wolf by Vic Muniz and he's one of the top 10 contemporary artists in 2016 by the Guardian newspaper in the UK. So it was really a big deal for us to have him in the community and create a work that really responded to the material culture of the community. And we had over 150 volunteers come out every night to help us assemble the work. So yeah, it was, it was quite an impressive moment for us and for, for the community that's really sort of gonna document this moment in time for Vic's career as well as Squamish and the Biennale. As I was mentioning as well, through our, our partnerships, I mean, it's been great working with the district and, you know, to, sorry, the, the $45,000 contribution that we've received both for the residency and the open air museum, we've been able to generate an additional 100,000 in the community through in-kind, through Quest, and additionally Biennale resources that have provided permanent legacies. So Hugo Franca, one of the Brazilian artists who was here for, for three weeks as well, he's, he created seven carved log sculptures and those have now been donated to different community groups I believe we were out here and we actually put out a public call to groups to approach us. And we had people like the Hospital Hill community, um, Les Anglons, the French, the Francophone school down here, as well as the, the Forestry Museum group that we donated some of these works to. And now they're permanently in the community, as well as two at the Sea to Sky Gondola as well, who are our partners. So moving ahead, I mean, we, we really believe in the residency program as the way forward to, to build these relationships and continue to grow the identity and sense of community in Squamish. And we're looking at bringing in four artists per year over the 2018-2020 exhibition, over two years, and partnering with Quest University as well to continue this relationship. So we would like to sort of continue our discussion with the district as well for the Open Air Museum, which is large-scale installations. And this time around, we really think we'd like to do something permanent and iconic, similar to what we did in New Westminster and in North Vancouver where there's the giant W, the 40-foot shipping containers down on the pier, because I think it would be really interesting for Squamish to have this landmark identity that's sort of a destination that captures the imagination of people coming into town or going through here that speaks to a sense of place. So those are some of the conversations we'd like to continue. And we actually have a new team member, Rachel Fakarson, who actually lives out of Squamish, and she's going to be our liaison out here, and also working on our education program, because all of this public art installations that we do really feeds into our education program, and we work with a couple of the schools here, Coast Mountain Academy, as well as the, the Francophone schools and a couple of the other primary schools through our education curriculum. So Rachel's going to be leading that as well over the next two years. Thank you. And uh, those are weatherproof. We can, the yes. intention is to put them up uh, so people can see them. In yeah, the that's... Yeah, Excellent. and we also brought um, catalogs actually for Rachel and the Council, which documents all of our projects over the last two years, and we bookmarked the, the Squamish pages of these new records. Thank you. Yeah, that's great.
I think you gave I think I did. Okay, perfect. So you only have sure. seven? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. I think I'll go up. Thank you. Um, and thank you, and, and, and since uh, the Biennale first approached us, I guess that was in 2013, even maybe even 2012, I can't remember, um, I think it helped, has helped inspire this understanding of public art and community, and we actually have a, a public art committee now, a select committee that deliberates on all this stuff, so I expect that's the next conversation for Biennale, to have a, a conversation with the public art committee. And um, that recommendation will come back to council at some point. So. Right. Yeah, I believe we're actually December 6th. I, I, I believe. I haven't oh, seen the agenda yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, but yeah, we're looking forward to, to working with Rachel being again in the community. It's going to be a great sort of liaison to explore those relationships and spaces because, again, Squamish is a very different place in the last four years. So we're looking forward to new, new ideas, new places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. Any questions for me and Ali at this point? Excellent. Thank you very much for coming up, and uh, hopefully Barry feels better. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, you know what? Uh, you can put them behind Susan, and we'll, we'll get them up this week. Thank you. And uh, finally, on our uh, delegations and proclamations list, we have... A recommendation that we declare the month of February 2018 as Heart, as Heart Month in the District of Squamish. Moved by Council Ray, seconded by Council Pryor. All those in favor? Opposed if any? Motion carries. Uh, consideration of unscheduled public attendance. Is there anyone in the audience who feels there is a pressing need that the need, Council needs to hear about before the next meeting? Don't see anybody? And. Um, we now have a public hearing uh, for District of Squamish Zoning Bylaw 2200-2011 Amendment Bylaw Cleveland Large Lot Interim FAR number 2572-2017. At the beginning of every public hearing, um, I do legislatively have to read this preamble, so bear with me. This public hearing is convened pursuant to Part 14, Division 3 of the Local Government Act to allow the public to make representations to Council respecting matters contained in the proposed District of Squamish Zoning Bylaw 2200-2011 Amendment by Bylaw Cleveland Large Lot Interim FAR number 2572-2017. Everyone present shall be given a reasonable opportunity to be heard or to present written submissions respecting matters contained in the proposed bylaw. No one will be discouraged or prevented from making their views known. However, it is important that remarks be restricted to the matters contained in the proposed bylaw. Members of Council may ask questions following presentations. However, the function of Council at a public hearing is to listen rather than to debate the merits of the proposed bylaw. In considering the proposed bylaw, Council has received documents which may influence its decision. These documents are available for review and comment and have been included as part of the Planning Department report or if received later, handed out at the meeting and included in the public hearing package. If any documents are submitted during the hearing, please feel free to review the document during the hearing by asking staff. Members of the public shall maintain order and quiet, shall not applaud or interrupt any speech or action of the members of council or any other person addressing council. I now call on the planning department to introduce the bylaw. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my name is Jonas Olenischkis, Director of Community Planning, and today I'll be introducing the staff report for uh, information for public hearing. So this is bylaw 2572. Uh, um, the rationale for this uh, proposed temporary bylaw is uh, related to the, uh, some of the deficiencies in the downtown commercial C4 zone. The, the zone doesn't have any floor area ratio, um, does not have a front setback, it does not have lot coverage provisions, and there are no minimum commercial uh, area requirements. And just a, a note that the, the limit on height is six stories uh, currently. Um, at the same time, we, the district over the last year has been doing um, a fairly comprehensive um, project to update the C4 zone um, and some of the setback requirements uh, specific to streets downtown. Uh, in terms of engagement to date, we've done a number of um, uh, public open houses and workshops. 
uh, what we've heard from the community so far, as well as from our advisory design panel, as well as in discussions with council, is that Cleveland really it deserves a separate treatment than the rest of uh, downtown streets. Um, there's a desire, desire to maintain that fine grain uh, on Cleveland Avenue as the main street in town. Uh, there's also a desire to make sure that we're not losing employment space uh, to, to mainly residential development and also ensuring that public open space is enhanced by adjacent development so that developments don't uh, overshadow or um, have a, a dominant effect on, on those streetscapes as well as our public parks. Uh, so the, the downtown um, C4 update process is projected to conclude in the first quarter of 2018. Uh, what uh, this bylaw proposes to do is uh, to essentially um, provide some time for that process to conclude before reviewing any um, large development permit applications. Uh, so the bylaw introduces a temporary floor area ratio for lots that are more than 0.2 of a hectare uh, between Main Street and Bailey Street, and we're really talking about six properties here. Um, some of which are smaller than 2.2 uh, of a hectare, but have a high consolidation potential with those larger properties. And the bylaw has a sunset clause, meaning that it would expire uh, by March 31st, 2018. So the floor area ratio requirement would no longer apply after that date. And the date is proposed as such uh, because it, we're fully expected to have concluded the uh, zoning update downtown. So it's really just buying time. For, uh, to make sure that we can finish the community engagement downtown and uh, bring forward a bylaw for council's consideration. So here's the map uh, showing the six properties. Um, it's, it's worthy of note that the floor area ratio, the proposed one of 1.5, would continue to maintain development potential on these properties. We're not proposing to sterilize the properties. Um, you could still probably put a five or six story building. What it means is that there's going to have to be larger setbacks, um, especially for the upper floors um, of the building. So it's, um, we're going to avoid that boxy uh, effect. Uh, so on November 7th, um, Council gave the bylaw first two readings. Uh, at that time, also Council um, issued um, uh, or passed a motion suspending any uh, new development permit applications that would be proposing to exceed uh, floor area ratio of 1.5 uh, from uh, coming forward until this bylaw is adopted. Uh, in terms of public comments, we've advertised the uh, public hearing in the chief newspaper. There's been a mail out to the property owners and tenants as well as the adjacent properties. We have received one written comment uh, today, uh, and the written comment uh, appears to be raising some concern with uh, the, uh, the lack of regulation in the C4 zone, um, and as well as concerns about this bylaw, uh, but it should be noted that this bylaw is actually um, include, establishing some temporary regulations in a place where we have none at the moment. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor, are there any questions for staff at this point? I just have one clarification question. Um, so if, a, if an application comes in between now and March 31st, it would simply have to apply to this FAR? Correct. And then uh, we anticipate having a finalized bylaw by March 31st, and then any subsequent date forward, it would Anything new, anything new proposal would, the new regulations would be applicable to, correct? That's correct, yes. Councillor Schmel. Thanks. So the, uh, the new regulations that are coming forward are all being uh, designed with the feedback that's already been given in, uh, over the years of public trends that we've done. All of that's being taken into consideration, and then by March 31st, we will definitely have a bylaw. When this goes away, what happens if we don't have a bylaw in place? Uh, we might have to, we fully expect that we will have a bylaw in place by that time. We, what we have left is we're planning to do one more session by the end of this month. 
uh, specific to the FAR uh, on Cleveland Avenue. Um, and then that should give us enough time, give us four months to finish that process. Any other questions for staff at this point? Um, so now um, I invite the public, uh, the applicant <coughs> representatives to comment on the proposed rezoning as well. Oh, that's us, so it's, we've already done that. Um, uh, after I've confirmed it is your turn, please approach the podium and commence your remarks by clearly stating your name and address. And please note that speakers will be given five minutes to address council. I do have one name um, on the speakers list, uh, Tejinder Bular. Welcome. Good evening, here in the council. Thank you. My name is Dejinder Buehler, owner of August Jack, motor known as, uh, rated as August Jack. Two companies are running it. August, two parcels, Mickey Enterprises and BMT Holding. And today I'm here to bring up major concern about proposed amendment to the district of Squamish rezoning by law is going to affect the value of our long life investment at a big time. Bylaw is going to affect, uh, normally we have seen the land value going up with this time, but this bylaw will bring it to as low as we never imagined. I'm a bit confused. Last time we got notice in the mail and it was talking about the same topic. When I came here and I also got the time to talk, speak, and it was changed and there was a lack of information, but this time we got the information on time. I'm here to say the same thing again. I'm here to cry, not to speak, only speak, because it is affecting. Our, our parcel is at the end, almost end of the Cleveland Avenue. As other two large lots are being developed or already developed, only our parcels left. And, uh, our company is one of the oldest companies in downtown and started by Dr. Kendry and very active member of the community. We are here from the last 17 years and we think it's unfair to our property. And it seems like somebody just woke up one day and decided they're going to change the bylaw and just target just for these four parcels being that not on all of the properties, out of the, all the Cleveland property, just four large properties. Let's target this one. And it seems like it's not right. It's unfair, but last time I talked, someone at the meeting, he said, oh, we can bring a proposal. If we bring a proposal, uh, we are developing, and it will not be refused. But since we brought a little proposal forward, this bylaw came, it will stop us. Totally. So, thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Um, is there anyone else who would like to speak at this public hearing? Can I ask a question? Sure. If you feel you're impacted by I'm not. bylaw. That's what, can I ask those media now, or is that okay? The purpose of the hearing is for the public to be able to speak and not necessarily for you to ask questions. Yeah, that's okay. okay. I'll ask you. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm not closing the public hearing, but I am seeing if there are any other hands. I don't see any hands, but I, I would perhaps, um, Mr. Valenskis, can you talk a little bit about uh, she ref the re there was a reference that this is only applying to six lots. Um, and maybe provide some context about uh, whether or not we need different regulations to apply to the smaller lots along Cleveland, and also perhaps um, <coughs> the um, disjointedness of what our downtown neighborhood plan and those those visions that have been around for a long time and how they mesh or don't mesh with our current C4 zoning. Okay. Can you, if maybe you can articulate, because this, this isn't something that's just all of a sudden come up. This has been an ongoing conversation for, for years. Yes, it, uh, it started in the early 2000s. Uh, the conversation, it, it, 
the draft downtown neighborhood plan went through different revisions. It hasn't been adopted yet. It's getting pulled into the official community plan. Um, the downtown neighborhood plan actually saw a much lower density uh, for Cleveland Avenue, which was two stories essentially um, for this stretch of it. Um, in terms of lot size, um, so the two stories doesn't mesh with the C4 zone uh, because the C4 zone allows up to six stories. It doesn't matter where you are, uh, what, what frontage you're on. Um, the, uh, the reason why this proposed bylaw only applies to large properties is because on majority of the properties in Cleveland Avenue are fairly small. And what happens with small properties is that the parking uh, essentially dictates how much density um, you can put on there, on the property. And it's very difficult to, um, you know, build a six-story building on a small property because the, the parking makes it unfeasible. What happens on a bigger property is, is parking, you can provide a lot more parking. Um, there's the efficiencies of scale and you can go to, um, you know, property line to property line essentially all the way up to six stories. Um, so that's why it's not, it's not a concern in the immediate future that these smaller properties are going to impact the form and character of Cleveland the way that some of these bigger properties would if they were developed to its full uh, C4 potential. And that's the reason why we're suggesting this temporary measure um, until we get to the uh, update of the whole C4 zone. And I, I just, maybe a piece of that history is we contemplated adopting the downtown neighborhood plan a number, when we started the OCP and we said, instead of sort of duplicating work, we would marry it into the OCP and so yes. it hasn't technically been adopted yet, even though it has been the prevailing vision out there for many years. Is that exactly. fair to say? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? For, and I don't think there was any other clarification needed so far. Council Fire. Well, maybe just... <clears throat> talk a little bit about the intersections and how you know the courtyard kind of concept on the intersections. You know, like um, that, that we, we we do have to speak to the bylaw and, and the relevance to the bylaw, and there are some intersection uh, parcels of land included in these six. So maybe speak to that specifically, just so we're focusing on the bylaw. So the, the, uh, these tend to be corner lots because they're of larger scale uh, that, are, that would be impacted by this bylaw. Uh, other than establishing a floor area ratio, the bylaw doesn't uh, treat corner lots any differently than any other lot. So there are, that's the, the difference between this bylaw and what the downtown, um, the, the zoning, the general zoning update that we're working on will do, which will it will impact some corner lots by establishing a greater setback uh, for active transportation purposes and streetscape purposes. But uh, for instance, Cleveland Avenue and Main Street intersection is unlikely that would be affected because those are the two streets where we have a wider right of way. Yeah, that's good. Oh, I just, they're all corner lots, but mm -hmm. uh, you know what I mean? I just want to to hear those words. Any other questions? I don't see any. Um, I will call uh, for a first time. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to speak to this bylaw? Uh, for a second time, is there anyone who wishes to make any further representations? And for a third time, is there anyone who wishes to make further representations? I thought David put his hand up there. <laughs> Seeing, uh, being no, no further speakers, um, I'll just ask Council one more time if there are any questions um, or comment. Seeing none. Um, I now close this public meeting, and um, once the public meeting, public hearing is closed, uh, no further submissions. Uh, council is not able to hear any further submissions, and um, it, Council can choose to consider the bylaw later today or at the next meeting. Um, and any and all communication between the public hearing and third reading should be channeled through staff. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next
Next up in the agenda, uh, first three readings of the District of Squamish Fees and Charges Bylaw Number 20, uh, 2012-2007, Amendment Bylaw 2573-2017. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. My name is Tim Hoskin. I'm the Director of Recreation Services. Uh, today you have in front of you a recommendation to update the fees and charges bylaw. Uh, there are two pieces to it. Uh, one is a fee to allow a charge uh, for skate rentals. Uh, the second is housekeeping. It is to update uh, the name change of the 55 uh, Activity Centre. Uh, there's a skate shop located in Brennan Park Recreation Centre that's historically been run by uh, community members, private contractors that have an interest in, in the community. Uh, they have provided low-cost uh, skate rentals and sharpening and some small retail sales. Uh, the contractors, uh, the previous lease expired in June and the previous contractor uh, was not interested in providing the service any longer. Uh, we went to an expression of interest uh, twice. Uh, we did not uh, secure a contractor that wanted to continue or to run uh, the skate shop. Uh, so uh, Recreation Services uh, took on the, uh, the providing of the skates uh, to the public so that uh, the public could have access to skates to uh, get to the public skate. Uh, what we are proposing is a fee for skates of two fifty dollars for uh, children, youth and seniors and that's including taxes and a fee of $5 for uh, adults. Uh, this will net a uh, revenue of approximately three thousand uh, dollars, and includes a couple of one-time purchases, such as a skate sharpener uh, and uh, skates. Yeah, uh, and the skate sharpener is just for uh, our skate rentals. It's not to provide a uh, skate sharpening uh, to the public. Uh, the name change of the 55, as I mentioned, is uh, housekeeping only and is to remain consistent uh, with our current uh, naming uh, uh, conventions. Uh, and that's it. Any, any questions? Thank you. Any questions for staff? Councilor Kent. Uh, just a question about who will do the sharpening. Will that be a staff member that will sharpen those uh, rental skates? Uh, through you, Mayor? Uh, yes. I think it's great that um, in the first month you've had about 300 rentals. Taking them out, even uh, granted they were free to put them out there for that first month, but, but I can, I'm sure that that will continue. But uh, I think it's I think it's great that you took the lead on that and went out and just took it anyway. Yeah, we're up to 769. Wow. Yeah. Is it really not a viable business? Or I'm curious why we didn't get interest in running it from somebody. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, I would say that the short answer is it, it's difficult to be a viable business if there's not a passionate contractor that wishes to give back to the uh, community. Uh, it, it, it would be a passion project if there's not enough revenue for uh, somebody to make a living at. Um, and uh, it's an important service. Uh, so I, I believe we should bring it in house. If um, curious if, for example, the Minor Hockey Association wanted to look at it as a fundraising a way to fundraise, mm -hmm. and they got a proposal. W would we be open to proposals? Should a group want to come and take this off our hands? I think it's great that we're yeah. providing it if there's no interest, but I do see this as an opportunity, maybe for fundraising for different groups, uh, as opposed to a, a business. But. Yeah. Uh, uh, we, we, we did do uh, two expressions of address and we did speak to all the user groups uh, and uh, everything we could to beat the bush to uh, bring somebody forward. Uh, so I wouldn't say no, uh, we're, we'd always be interested in new partnerships, new, new ways to uh, support groups. Uh, and if they brought something forward that uh, would work and be sustainable, uh, we would entertain that. Uh, just um, it's a little bit off subject, but how's the 55 doing? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, we have a open house uh, coming up shortly, uh, and we will extend the invite again to uh, council and the community. Uh, there's uh, a lot of very positive things developing. Uh, it, it, the, uh, the Eagle Wind Cafe is now open. Uh, and they will uh, do their hard start at the open house. Uh, they are currently doing their soft start, uh, but food is available. Uh, and uh, I think there's a genuine sense of uh, renewed vigor. Great name. <laughs> uh, any more questions? I don't see anyone. There is um, a bylaw in front of council to give it first three readings, but he's in charge of bylaw. Chief by Councillor Kent, seconded by Councillor Race. I don't see any hands. Uh, call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Council. Thank you. Uh, next up, Council can consider a third reading of the District of Swamish Zoning Bylaw Amendment by La Cleveland Large Lot Interim FAR number 2572-2017. We'll move that, Council Race. Moved by Council Race, seconded by Council Cryer. Council Race, must be to it. Thank you. Just briefly, I, I um, I take the point that th this will affect temporarily um, properties in Cleveland Avenue, but from my perspective, this is a pause. Uh, it's not the end of the process. Uh, we are uh, completing, as staff stated, uh, a consultation with uh, stakeholders uh, to come up with probably revised C4 zoning, uh, and it just makes sense to include all of these large lots in that process. And so that's the reason for this, and that's the reason I can support this. Uh, it's, I do have difficulty supporting things that are very specific to certain properties and as the proponent mentioned it seems odd that it's just very specific, there's no, it doesn't seem to be a real rationale to just pick out properties if we want to maintain the character of all of Cleveland Avenue. Um, maybe you know, just can speak to that specifically as far as a question from, that I had for the public forum. I don't believe that, I think the question has already been answered, so I think we can reiterate it. We're not compromising the public hearing. Ms. Arthurs? Um, thank you. Can you um, there? The reason why uh, this bylaw is proposed to apply only to large properties is because, as previously state, stated, the small, smaller properties are largely ruled by the parking uh, requirements, which prohibit them from going uh, very dense. And we don't see, from, from looking at other development permits, such as uh, the main, you know, that was, that was a good example of what a C4 zone could produce on a large lot. And um, it was seen by, um, by the community as a little too far in terms of the forming character on Cleveland Avenue. Right. So, can I just follow up with that? Like, so, uh, also... So just behind it on Logan Lane, we don't have those same concerns, although that's where our views will be blocked. We haven't stepped down. We have large large developments happening that are higher than they're like with flood construction levels and higher than six floors. And yet we want to reduce on the larger lots. Seems I mean, I understand having good form and character on Cleveland Avenue that we haven't really decided that by March we're going to decide what that form and character is going to be and then set a set of design criteria for the entire length of Cleveland Avenue, which will include density and height restrictions. And I think there's a question there. Go ahead. Yeah, so as it relates to Loggers Lane, um, with our engagement to date, uh, we've identified Cleveland as deserving a uh, distinct um, approach versus the rest of downtown core. So Loggers Lane and 2nd and 3rd Avenue. With respect to development that is being proposed in Loggers Lane, it's actually quite low FAR. Uh, it's at around 1.75, um, which is probably closer to what would be appropriate on Cleveland. Thank you. I think the other piece that um, might be missed is that there are other large lots that are zoned C2 fueling station, comprehensive development zone that are captured through a process of rezoning. Absolutely. These That's ones aren't captured through any process right now as we envision the downtown uh, Main Street. So. And, and 
understand that because this is temporary. I know we till March 31st, and I look forward to being able to comment on that bylaw proposal. So I can support it. And any other comments or questions? Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to it briefly. Um, it is an interim measure uh, to help give us the time to marry the vision as is being uh, teased out in the community um, with with our, our regulations and our, our zoning by our zoning definitions and parameters. So um, it, 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 I think we need this time. It, it's a big process to go through a, a visioning. We have all these documents that sort of fed into the process over the years that haven't coalesced the vision. And we need to do that, so we're, we're, we're deciding on a downtown for the future for 70 years from now, for 50 years from now, and to take four months, five months to sort of allow that to come to its fruition, then I think that's prudent. So. I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? If any, motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Adoption, District of Squamish, election and assent voting bylaw number 2420-2017. Um, there's a recommended motion to be, that it be adopted. Moved by Councillor Elliott, seconded by Councillor Pryor. All those in favour? Opposed? If any, motion carries. Uh, District of Zoning bylaw number 2200-2011, amendment bylaw 39773 and 39777, Government Road, uh, number 2464-2016. And there's a recommended motion... Um, that the district authorized the mayor and corporate officer to execute the land development agreement as attached to the report from the community planning infrastructure dated November 21st, 2017, and that the district of Swamish zoning bylaw number 2200-2011 amendment bylaw 39773 and 39777 government road number 2464-2016 be adopted. We need to separate. We will do one at a time. Um, is there a mover for uh, the land development agreement? Moved by Councillor Race, seconded by Councillor Black and Wolf. Uh, anyone like to speak to it? Adoption. I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. <coughs> and then there is adoption of the bylaw. Is there a mover? I'll move it. Is there a seconder? Second by Councillor Black and Wolf. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Staff reports Community Planning and Infrastructure Integrated Stormwater Management Plan Phase 1 Contract Award. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is David Wilson. I'm a Municipal Engineer with the District of Squamish. Today, the objective is seeking Council's authorization to award a consulting services contract for an integrated stormwater management plan to be completed by Urban Systems. Some background is that in 2015, uh, the district completed a liquid waste management plan and that recommended that the district undertake an integrated stormwater management planning in order to evaluate both drainage capacity and stormwater quality entering our water courses. Following this, the district applied for and received a $160,000 grant under the Gas Tax Strategic Priorities Fund to, in order to complete phase one of an integrated stormwater management plan. So the scope of this project is uh, is the, to lay the groundwork for subsequent catchment-specific integrated stormwater management plans. So there's four main tasks of this project. The first is to complete an asset management plan for all stormwater assets. Second is to complete a gap analysis of all of the district's policy, so our subdivision development control bylaw, official community plan, previous drainage plans. Third is to develop an environmental monitoring program in order to determine the state of our water course health and to monitor water quality trends over time. And then finally is to prepare a template and framework for future catchment specific integrated stormwater management plans. There will be a minimum of two stakeholder workshops as well as two council discussions through this project, but one of the first uh, steps in this project is to determine communications and engagement plan with the consulting team in order to ensure that we're appropriately engaging the community. In terms of procurement, staff uh, prepared a request for proposals. It went to BC bid. We received three competitive proposals from the consulting community, and ultimately the evaluation team felt that Urban Systems was providing the greatest value to the district. And so the recommendations are that the District of Squamish award the consulting services contract for phase one integrated stormwater management plan to Urban Systems at a cost of $150,000 and that the mayor and corporate officer be authorized to execute the contract or, or execute the agreement. 
Thank you. Um, questions, Councilor Elliott. Um, thank you for the report. Um, will urban systems be looking at natural assets as part of this plan? So I know it says confirm inventory, but will it be looking at our natural inventory, which means we don't have to spend money on infrastructure? Through the mayor, that was presented as an option in their proposal, so that wasn't included in the base cost, but there is a potential to look at that. And I think there is merit to doing that because we have, especially with stormwater in terms of our assets, uh, natural assets are very important and uh, preserving uh, pervious space and natural uh, storage for stormwater is important. So uh, as well as ditches and swales are also somewhat of a natural asset. So I think that there is merit to including that and it, it was presented as an option. So do we have the budget for that option? Yeah, like how do we I, tease out that option should council decide to extend it there? So we, we have a $160,000 grant and their proposal was for $150,000. So there is $10,000 of remaining budget that we could allocate towards um, looking at natural assets. And that would cover it? Yes, I think so. Uh, I'm not sure the extent, but I will have to have those discussions with urban systems. Uh, I brought up natural assets lots of years uh, to go into the budget to actually map and make sure that we understand our natural assets and that's exactly the intention is to understand permeable surfaces and as well extend the infrastructure. Uh, so I would be fully in support of doing that but also going a little bit further as far as mapping our permeable surfaces would be, would that be included in that proposal is, you know, having an actual comprehensive mapping system so that when it gets redu reduced, it gets added to an inventory. I would need to discuss that with the consultants. Um, I think the general approach is to look at what natural assets are, what function they provide, uh, what their value is, and then to, to place a value on them so that we understand uh, if we're taking them away or impacting them, reducing their effectiveness, that there's a, there is a value associated with that. Um, in terms of the specific methods, I would have to have further discussions with the consultant. So a value and an outcome that has to be done in order to replace the infrastructure, the natural infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, at the end of this, uh, we have parameters on uh, permeable and impermeable surfaces on private land or in lands period. I think that that will be included in the gap analysis, so we'll be looking at policy, and I think that as part of that there should be an opportunity to develop policy, especially where there's areas of concern. Um, right now it's, it is fairly open-ended um, in terms of the scope and identifying what those issues are and what the solutions are, like we're really at uh, step one right now. And so I think first is to identify what the, the gaps are and then to be developing solutions uh, to address them. So, I, you know, Council has been uh, discussing uh, natural assets for a while, um, particularly since Gibson's has done their analysis. So, I think Council is very interested in okay. in the additional piece to their proposal, but it, okay. I think we may also be interested in even more than what they propose. So, perhaps that's something you explore with them as well. Sure. Okay. Thank you for that. I think we want it to be comprehensive and really take into account those natural assets that particularly on the um, drainage and absorption side of things are, are really important. Okay, th yeah. thank you for that feedback. Uh, there is flexibility within the proposal to reallocate resources, so I'll make sure that um, natural assets are a focus of the plan. Thank you. Councilor Reyes. Well, and I echo those terms, and if there's a budget impact to that analysis, um, we're entering into a budget discussion, so this would be the time. Okay, yes. That'd be great. Um, <clears throat> maybe we'll just fortify that in a motion just so it's, it's really clear. There is a motion uh, proposed in front of uh, Council uh, that the district award the consulting services contract phase one integrated stormwater management plan to urban systems at a cost of $150,000 and that the mayor and corporate officer be authorized to execute uh, the contract in, uh, and execute or the agreement or execute the contract or execute the agreement. Um, perhaps um, 
I'll entertain that motion, but we might have subsequent motion that staff explore augmenting the contract with a comprehensive uh, asset management, uh, natural asset strategy to be, if, ne if necessary, through the 2018 budget process. Councilor Cryer? Um, you moving that? Well, I just want one, one question before going to that, if I can. Is it tied into the green building code at all? No. No. no there's another piece to this, the subdivision <coughs> development control bill and other things that this may inform. Yes. This is the first step in informing some other, as David, some other, other maybe policy pieces or bylaws that may need to be updated once these master plans are done. Yeah. On the finance piece, yeah. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Get a bit of clarification. Right now, you're awarding the contract, but you're only awarding it for 150. If you would like a consultant to do more than that, I would. Uh, we haven't, we haven't moved the motion yet, so yeah. Councilor Fire? Uh, I thought I heard our engineer say that he was still able to change part of the scope. And so the budget was 160. Yes. The proposal was 150. So we may want to augment it at a cost up to. 160 to include the as uh, the natural asset component of the suburban systems proposal, but I think there's another piece to it. If if that's not getting us comprehensive enough, we might want to have another motion to say that an additional um, if, if additional monies are needed to get us what we want, yeah. it comes to budget. Council mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh I was going to suggest that we just go with the staff recommendation, which takes us to the 150 for this contract. Uh, if the staff has our point on the analysis that we're looking for, uh, and if that results in a budget difference, um, to bring it back to budget so for discussion. So um, I think, in my mind at least, it's simply just to deal with the staff recommendation for this particular proposal. As a step, and then if there, if there is a shortfall, we'll just deal with that as a second, second step. Although my understanding is that we we could do it up to 160 to include the natural asset component that's already proposed as an add-on, potential add-on already, so we they wouldn't even have to come back for that if we did it. But I think what I'm hearing from council is we want it to go above and beyond that potentially, and we want to know what that number is, and we deliberate on it in the budget. That's correct. We don't want it to go above and beyond that. We want to get the natural assets in it. <laughs> you know, I mean, we're, we're already adding 10,000, and now we're going above and beyond that. And I thought I heard you say that you'd be able to get that from what we had coming. That's not what I heard, but go ahead. Through Please the mayor, clarify that. Through the mayor. So the, the budget is up for $160,000. The base scope of their services is for $150,000. So what I was saying is that we have $10,000 of grant money on the table. That $10,000 could be put towards natural assets. I'm not sure the extent of if that will go far enough to do a complete um, analysis of natural assets. That those, That's the discussion that I would need to have with the consultant to understand is, is that sufficient budget or would uh, would further budget be required to make that a, a comprehensive analysis? Or to look at it backwards, what are we getting for that extra 10000 in terms of the natural assets mm -hmm. analysis? And I, that's, I, that's what we're saying. We're I, well, it just seems funny that we offer more money. We haven't offered any more money. And nobody's suggesting that. We're suggesting that if there is more money needed to increase the scope substantively and to get a real natural assets evaluation through this program, that it be brought back for deliberation of council. We're not approving anything. You can vote against it, Council Fire. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, just, just to clarify, I think we're saying um, that the that the motion would be up to a max up to a maximum of one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. There's no motion on the floor right now. Council can, is contemplating whether or not we simply go with what you've recommended and you explore further and maybe have to come back for a motion. Or council saying clearly we want natural assets included in this stormwater management plan, which I think I'm hearing the majority of council articulate, in which case 
our grant money is 160. We can get some of that for 160, but the conversation that hasn't happened is what exactly are we getting? And is it going to meet our goals? In terms of really understanding. So we're not we're not adding any new budgetary monies on today, but we're saying we want to hear we want to be able to make a decision on that in the future at the budget if we need more budget. If we don't need our budget, awesome. If the grant money covers it, great. Yeah, I, I guess my concern is that we have um, a proposal for $150,000 on the floor right now. Enough to move, but in front of us. Um, are we giving staff the authority to spend an extra $10,000, or do we want them to come back to us and tell us what they might get for that $10,000, and we decide if that's enough or if we want to go further? That's why I think, in my mind, it's, it's two steps. Um, what's here? Front of us now, and and then eventually, or soon probably, a report whether that's enough to get us what we want and how much that might cost. Is it in the ten thousand, or do we have to go even farther than that? I think David has an enlightened moment. Yeah, I apologize. Um, the, it, it, they provide the value within the proposal that I have right here, and it's actually at ten thousand dollars to do a valuation of natural assets. So it looks like if we awarded for a hundred sixty thousand dollar contract, that would include this optional task of completing a, a, a natural asset. So we could award the contract for one hundred sixty thousand dollars and include this optional task. That's what I thought you said. I didn't yeah. realize that the, well, this was did, valued he in did, here. He didn't say that value was actually there. He wasn't sure if it'd be more. Are <laughs> you moving it, Councillor Fire? That's Councillor Are you moving? <laughs> <laughs> Moved by Councillor Pryor, second by Councillor Rice. What do you mean? And you got my dinner. I'll call the question. I'm, I'm glad the natural assets conversation yeah. because it has been something we've all been thinking about for a while, so we should get that on there. Right and then the motion is, I'm assuming, Councillor Pryor, that uh, 160 to include the natural assets component. Mm -hmm. Correct, Councillor um, I'll call the question. All those in favor? If any motion carries. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you. Um, community planning infrastructure. Uh, no, next. Corporate services, recreation, and culture. Microsoft Enterprise Agreement renewal. Welcome, Conrad. Good evening. I'm Conrad Cordell, uh, manager of IT. Uh, I'm here uh, asking that council approve a resolution uh, to award a three-year agreement to Microsoft uh, valued at $250,000 <clears> over the three years uh, for desktop, server, and software licensing. Um, our current enterprise agreement is up for renewal at the end of the month. Um, Microsoft software is, is used on desktops or backend servers. Um, to provide critical systems and tools for uh, daily operations. Uh, licensing also provides staff with uh, uh, remote and uh, mobile access to our district systems. Um, and we're taking advantage of the uh, discounted bulk pricing uh, that's been negotiated by the province. Uh, uh, we are looking at an increase of about $12,000 per year. That has been considered in our budget process this year. Um, uh, that increases mainly due to additional staff, uh, but also more systems, more databases, uh, uh, and more servers. Um, at this point, there really isn't a viable alternative uh, to these systems, uh, but we will continue to explore options um, as they become more reliable and stable. Thank you. I'm open to questions. Questions, Councillor um, Kent. Um, thank you, Conrad. Now, this is part of our digital strategy as well as the strategic plan for updating our systems and IT and all of that. Uh, but I have a question here. I'm just looking at the implications budget and going back to what you just said the annual increase of 12 grand because of base cost increases by Microsoft and additional user demand. What is the, can you, can you parse that out for me? What's the difference between the, their base cost increases and the, the, our demand? The base cost increases are minimal. They're really just inflationary so it's mostly demand driven. It's really the, the increase in staff and, and systems. 
I'm here today to present on the Community Emergency Preparedness Fund. This is a suite of funding programs intended to enhance the resiliency of local governments to respond to emergencies. Last week, the District of Squamish and Squamish Nation submitted an application for the Emergency Social Services Grant stream. We submitted an application to do a project with Squamish Nation for mass care. Um, this is a joint partnership between District of Squamish and Squamish Nation, and it's building upon our previous relationship. So we have a joint reception center team in which district staff and Squamish Nation staff work together to coordinate and manage, it, manage reception centers. The purpose of this application is to increase mass care resiliency within the Cedar Sky Corridor. So what we're planning to do in 2018 is a series of workshops and a joint exercise with Squamish Nation that will be open to the rest of the corridor, rest of the cor corridor to um, increase our resiliency so that we can all be on the same page for mass care planning. Um, this, inc this consists of a series of workshops. Um, we'll do one exercise and then we'll have joint equipment so that everyone is more in the standardized um, so that we can all support and respond to emergencies together. And I'm just here today to request council pass a resolution um, in support of the Community Emergency Preparedness Fund application um, and willingness to provide overall grant management. There is no impact to the 2018 emergency program budget. Any questions for Alexis? How can you say no to a big smile like that? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You just, is this your last time you're presenting to us before oh, you take your sojourn? Uh, no, I'm not sure. I haven't got my mission yet. I'm patiently waiting. So um, I, I'm just, I was supposed to find out last week if I got me at Myanmar, but I didn't find out. So I don't think I got Myanmar. So I'm, I'm here until they find my mission. Well, can, I, can I tell people what you're doing? Uh, Alexis is working for Médecins Sans Frontières in their logistics division. Uh, you've gone to do your training and now you may be dispatched to some yeah. um, um, crazy country. place. Yeah, so, so far um, it's between uh, Myanmar, Bangladesh, Nigeria, um, I forget the other question, but the last one was Somalia, but I'm definitely not going to go to Somalia. <laughs> well. We wish you all the best. I know this is going to be a great growth and learning. I know we're a little off topic, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm living vicariously through uh, Alexis's adventures. Um, I know you're going to go learn tons and see lots, and we just want you to be safe and uh, keep your head down, and I know you'll do a great job. Thanks. Thank you so much. So on the topic at hand, um, is there anyone who would like to move the um, motion in front of Council, in front of Council Pants, put by Councilor Chappelle? I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Good job. Thank you. Be safe. Thank you. I have a motion. And uh, next up, SAC reports uh, Community Grant Applications Squamish Skating Club. Um, they have an event coming up, uh, and there's a motion that uh, we approve the request for a grant and aid from the Skating Club in the amount of eight, $885.88. For ice rental for their Christmas show, and that it be allocated from council contingency. I will move that, seconded by Councillor Elliott. I used to do skating pageants when I was a kid, <laughs> so I have a little soft spark for this. So uh, good luck, all those fabulous skaters. And I remember I used to wear my costumes for Halloween every year after the skating pageant. So we had like a fox costume and a panda costume, and then it was. Yeah. yeah, I know, but it's so cute. Um, so everyone go check out the uh, skating Christmas skating pageant, and uh, happy to support this. I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. 
Uh, there are a number of correspondence, correspondence for action. I'll just go through them. Uh, there's one from D. Monroe regarding community consultation with pedestrian cycle sa safety at Cleveland Avenue on Highway 99. We did have quite a good conversation about a connected topic um, at the committee earlier today, so there is a recommended motion that we refer to this to staff. This is an ongoing file that we have been ongoing for a long time. Mm -hmm. Councilor Race moves, seconded by Councilor Black and Wolf. Call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Um, traffic calming on Government Road. Uh, that the correspondence be referred by P. Uh, Program be referred to the engineering staff. The follow up moved by Councillor Elliott, seconded by Councillor Chappelle. Uh, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Um, there's a there's a a letter from me in response to an email we got, um, and that it be referred to staff. I think staff have already sort of been talking with them, but motion to refer to staff. Moved by Councillor Ray, seconded by Councillor Pryor. All those in favor? All those motion carries. There's an ALC policies and draft guidelines for exclusion notification. Uh, motion to refer to staff. Moved by. Councillor Pryor, seconded by Councillor Race. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. There is a letter from Pam Gliatis uh, supporting um, their application to Capital University to provide uh, services here in Squamish for refugee services. Moved by refugee services. Uh, it, yes. yes. Or, or settlement services. Settlement services. Moved by Councillor Elliott. Yeah. I'll yes. second it. Yes, Councillor Elliott. Um, so they need the letter by tomorrow. I think the letter's drafted. Okay. And so um, that's actually a good thought. I'm at the SLRD tomorrow, so maybe if it's ready, I'll sign it. Is it ready? No. Oh. Okay. okay. We haven't. Okay. We're good. Okay. I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Um, there's a letter from Meg Fellows regarding the Turtle Trail, and there's a motion to refer it to the budget for discussion. Moved by Councillor Race, seconded by Councillor Wacken Wolf. All those in favor? Opposed? The motion carries. Uh, there's correspondence um, for Brian March and uh, C. Murrell. Uh, I responded to both of those, but there's a motion to receive those correspondences. Moved by Councillor Elliott, seconded by. Yes, race. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Um, approval of minutes. Special business meeting for November 7th. Special regular business meeting for November 7th. Budget committee to whole November 14th. Committee to whole November 14th. Um, and the recommended motion is to receive, to approve those minutes. Move by. Council race. Second by. Robin's the only person with their hand up. <laughs> All those in favor? Motion carries. There's a recommended motion from the budget meeting that staff present the utilities file for the first meeting on December 5th and a proposed uh, as and proposed at the November 14th, 27th Committee of the Whole with a change to reflect the fee increase for dirty wood to meet similar revenue needs as in 2017. Moved by Councillor Elliott, seconded by Councillor Kent. All those in favor? Opposed to Penny, motion carries. Another recommended motion that council accept the accessibility icon report for information and, if necessary, that staff bring back a budget amount to implement the changes. Um, I think we really wanted to move a motion that we adopt the new uh, icon, not just yeah. accept the report. So I'll entertain a motion to adopt the new icon and bring back a budget item if needed. Moved by Councillor Kent, second by Councillor Race. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Are we keeping up, Councillor Spell? <laughs> and uh, the, there's another recommended motion that the District of Squamish provide a letter of support to the Canadian Mountain Municipalities Consortium uh, executed by the CAO. Is there a motion? I'll move that. Seconded by? Councillor Pryor. All those in favor? Opposed, if any. Motion carries. And uh, seniors housing that Council received the seniors housing rezoning and development permit information report. For information and provide feedback. Well, we already did that. Uh, Receive the report. Moved by Councillor Elliott, seconded by Councillor Chappelle. All those in favor? Opposed? 
motion carries. Is there any business arising from limits? Committee minutes and reports. Community Development Standing Committee, there is a motion to receive for information. Move by. Council Black and Wolf, second by. Councilor Kent, all those in favor. Opposed, motion carries. There's a committee recommendation that staff develop and bring forward a framework for prioritization of development projects to the December Community Development Committee. And then in the meantime, 100% purpose built rental be given prioritization. Is there a mover? Moved by Councilor Black and Wolf, seconded by. I'll second that, or Council Ray seconds that. All those in favor? Opposed, motion carries. And there's a further recommendation that staff bring back a short term rental issues to the budget discussion for 2018. Yeah. I need to make an amendment on that one because that wasn't the full motion that was put forward at the meeting. So it should read um, that staff bring back short term rental issues to the budget discussion for 2018 and that staff put together a proposal on the regulation of short term rental properties. In they were connected. Well, I think, the, yeah, the piece that's missing is that what we're deliberating in the budget is the proposal on for regular right right goods. So, so I think that clarifies the motion. Um, otherwise, we just get referred to budget. We don't know what we're referring to. Yeah, so the, the referral was to refer to budget so we could discuss regulating it. So Moved by Councilor Elliott. Seconded by I'll second uh, Councilor Black and Wolf. I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? If any, motion carries. Public art. Um, the, the minutes from the public art select committee uh, be received for information. November 8th. Moved by Councilor Early. I'll second that. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. All right. Uh, council staff in camera announcements. Councilor Spell. Um, it's not really an in-camera announcement, it's uh, something that I probably should have brought up at the beginning of the meeting, and I was just uh, remembering when we get to the discussion of SORCA and grants, every year we give the same amount of SORCA, we give a large amount of SORCA, it's never in our budget line, and we don't really, we sort of talk about having a discussion about a permanent recurring amount uh, being put into our budget. And I'm wondering if we can, Rosalind has an amazing structure for funding trails, and it's a reoccurring amount in the budget every year. Instead of having it be a community proposal, we give it every year. I think it deserves to be something that's actually in the budget. Rosalind puts it in the Parks and Recreation, uh, and they call it Trail Management and Development. And I think that's something worthy of considering for the amount of not any more money, or even less money, or a different funding model. Maybe now tourism puts money in as well, so we can lessen the money, uh, and we and we equal funding from other sources and more equal and or match funding from other sources. So I'd like to look at an innovative model for that this year in our budget. We can certainly discuss that in the budget process. That's something to bring up. Absolutely. Okay, is that something? Uh, okay. Okay. Either so next finance that committee that meeting that or the budget committee meeting. I, and it'd be interesting, maybe we do a little digging on what Rosalind does. I know because we're giving to a third party, there's challenges with putting it into an actual budget item, and we we broke it out so that we have these community partner that sort of have a different resonance. So uh, Tourism Squamish, um, Sorca, SAR, and I think that Arts Council wants to sort of elevate to that sort of level of community partner in the budget deliberations. Um, but anyway, maybe we'll look at what Rosalind does. They might have. They might be giving it to a different entity. Exactly. So, yeah. It's, it's the model that Circle was requested to look at. So, if 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 it works, if we can make it work, we can make it work. But if we can we can bring it to a budget discussion. That'd be great. Thank yeah. you. Absolutely. Um, any other? Um, uh, any other? Uh, oh, actually, at, um, that was that was council staff in camera announcements. That wasn't yeah, that an was in camera announcement. That was, <laughs> uh, unscheduled public attendance. We don't have any open question period clarification related to agenda items. You don't ask for a good I question don't now. Have a question anymore? No, it's all, it's all <laughs> you got, got it answered. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's fine. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Councillor staff announcements. Um, I do want to say I love it when those Quest students come in and inundate our, our committee and our chambers and bring ideas and thoughts and do some proactive analysis and digging out there. 
a great job and um, um, so uh, um, just acknowledging also Arna and Michelle who uh, is uh, one of the group organizing a, a conference up at Quest that sounds really interesting. Um, again we had a wonderful Remembrance Day ceremony um, highlighted by a fly pass which was kind of cool. There was two helicopters and two planes that flew by and um, uh, we had it outside again, I guess for the second year in a row, down at the Cenotaph, and it was really well attended, and the rain held out just enough to make it uh, okay. <laughs> um, we um, uh, went to the Chamber of Commerce luncheon last week, where our MLA Jordan Sturdy was speaking. Um, it was it was actually more of a Q and A with um, with the MLA. It was actually a really nice format, and I thought he did a really good job. He did a really nice um, bipartisan job. It was just really nice and clear and direct, and uh, I thought he did an excellent job. And uh, Chambers seems to be a healthy, thriving organization these days. We had um, a number of us participated in the Sea to Sky Health Conference Congress. I guess Council Elliott was there, and uh, last week um, we hosted the first one, and this was. Um, the North Shore has been doing a Congress for quite a while, and in our conversations with BCH, we, Council talked about the possibility of sort of creating our own Congress in the Sea to Sky, and so we, we uh, offered to host the first one here in Squamish, and we had it last week. Um, conversation mostly about uh, homeless, uh, um, social inequity and poverty, and all those things that influence that, and health. And uh, had Seth Klein here uh, speaking, um, talk a lot about living wage and um, a variety of other things. And I'll just look to Councillor Elliott, who was there as well, maybe to speak to more things. Good participation with some First Nations there, Pemberton and Whistler, uh, as well as um, SYD and some of the other um, social services and health providers in the community. So good, robust conversation, lots of participation. Um, and. I think it's the start for something quite uh, collaborative and um, the conversation at the end was about how do we make this relevant for Sea to Sky. We don't necessarily just want to copy what the North Shore does. Um, they have it much more elected official focused and I think the general outcome of our meeting was we want it to be really collaborative, inclusive and deliberative and we're going to create our own model for how this Congress should as a group, as a Sea to Sky group. Uh, Councilor, you want to add to that at all? I would just say that that's the really important takeaway that I had is that our, our um, not-for-profit groups that are working um, with us on the social determinants of health are, are really important to have in there. I think it's really valuable to have them hear the information with us mm -hmm. and, and they can push us on policy change. And, um, so yeah, I, I was really grateful that we actually had that opportunity and there was great representation from the core. I was, Mm -hmm. really pleasantly surprised and so now we can start having a corridor conversation about you know what are we going to do about potentially living wage or housing or early childhood development and, and since many of um, like see this guy um, community services uh, service and the women's center they serve the whole corridor so what we do here it's helpful if they're we're following some more policy in Whistler and Pemberton so, yeah it's great to have Councillor Spell. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm sad I just thought of this for a second. Uh, but uh, I, I think those, those conversations are incredibly important, but it's also, uh, we always sort of seem to misplace how our economy is doing in, all, in, in our health determinants as well. <coughs> you know, the debt equity and the living wage and uh, all those things in isolation. And I've been thinking a lot about this as far as you know, encouraging tourism as our base industry in Squamish and as, as our economy is transitioning, how we want to transition that. And I really, it'd be great to have more economic updates from Kate. I think that uh, it'd be great to hear about the BRE plan and uh, how we're integrating economy into health determinants as well, because all of those things don't act outside of our economic measures. And, and that was the crux of this con conversation yeah, at, at the Congress well, was, yeah, it, was pro it was more than just poverty, it was economic uh, disparity, it was, and one of the, I thought, really great points that both uh, Dr. Lucician and Seth Klein made was, 
um, the health outcomes are directly correlatable to socioeconomic uh, status, income, whatever you want to call it. Directly correlated on all levels of health. Like it was, it was, it's so convincing. And so if you can bring everyone out of poverty, you are, you are improving everybody's health outcomes. So that point was made solidly. The other piece was that government works in silos and we don't connect the dots between justice, between economic development, between health outcomes, between all these things. And that was sort of an underlying thing, is how do you deconstruct silos so that everyone's contributing and paying into a solution and not just, okay, you, uh, Ministry of Health, you figure that out, and you, Ministry of Justice, you figure that out, and you, municipalities, figure that out. It has to be done comprehensively. That was really the crux of the whole conversation. Excellent information, thank you. Um, can I add one word? I have one more thing and then I'll go to you. Yep. On that? Or a different yep. topic? Um, yeah, just one other thing. Um, I went to the uh, annual uh, Squamish Hospital Foundation Wine and Cheese, and this was really acknowledging their big donors and the big projects that they do. And uh, the Hospital Foundation is one of those organizations that plugs away and raises money and does such a good job at augmenting services and facilities at the hospital. And they do so under the radar in a very confident, quiet, fantastic way. So just congratulations to them. And they seem to be really um, having some success there. And I think there's been a bit more of a, we had um, up at the Cedar Sky Hospital District, we had the chairs for the hospital foundations, as well as VCH in the room to talk about these things. And it sounds like there's a bit better of a communication with VCH and the foundations now to be able to target and st strategically target uh, projects that are much more, that a foundation can actually leverage to make money on instead of, there used to be, VCH would sort of say, oh, can we raise money for an elevator? It's like, well, it's hard to raise money for an elevator, but if you raise money for a, this particular, like an MRI or CT or whatever they're raising money for, they can actually leverage that into more money. So there seems to be better communication and some success on that front with VCH and the foundations, which is great. Susan. Councilor Scott. Thanks. Uh, I was away for a week in Cleveland and went to an AI conference on city and data. AI gave a presentation on making more data informed decisions uh, for interoperable systems wide urban and regional change at Medium Minds. And it was an incredible conference, as it always, I generally go every year. Um, and it was, really, first of all, interesting to go to whenever you go to the cities. You get tours of all the infrastructure and different systems and how they interact and how policy decisions affect all the different areas, including equity and poverty and change. And uh, the conversation was with the chief information officer and uh, the head of Black and Beach, which were uh, dis just uh, one community. If you have a chance to look up one community, it's how they made internet accessible and social services uh, accessible to all their citizens and how it generally did bring people up from poverty because they could ask, access their social services online and a lot of barriers to poverty, uh, to, to coming out of poverty. So it was a really interesting and valuable conference. Yeah, I think the digital divide is going to become more pronounced as as these technologies ramp up and, yeah. and mm -hmm. our, I know our digital strategy references that pretty strongly to make sure that we're keeping that equity within the entire community. So, yeah, sounds really interesting. Anybody else? Don't see anything. Um, I'm going to look for a motion to terminate. You, you don't have anything? You're good? Okay. Moved by Councillor Pryor, <laughs> second by Councillor Kent. All those in favor? Disposed. Motion carries. <coughs>